please, and turn to the book of James chapter number one. James chapter number one. I want to add on a little bit to this morning's message. Not it's the same message, but along kind of the same uh, thought pattern. This morning I preached on spiritual growth, and we talked about growing in our faith. And so tonight I want to preach a message. Um, I preached basically the same message many years ago here. And, uh, and it's, I won't change the title, but it's when, the title is When God Stretches Our Faith. When God Stretches Our Faith. I'm going to add some things to it for tonight, but, but if you can remember back, oh, probably 10, 15 years ago, this might sound familiar. I know Mrs. Wark has every sermon I've ever preached memorized. And so she's, uh, she has, her mind is like a trap door, just, just never lets anything out. Amen. Uh, even when you want it to come out, it just won't. Uh, <laughs> so James chapter number one, and I want to read just a few verses to get started tonight. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, notice this, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. This idea that we are to count it joy when we fall into diverse temptations. You know, it's interesting sometimes to realize the commands that God gives us are because they are not second nature to us. He gives us commands along the lines of things that we would struggle with. And struggling would be a light uh, term for what happens when we have problems that come into our life, though the last thing we think about is rejoicing about it. It's like, uh, you know, problems come in your life. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, no, that's not our first thought. Hopefully we get to that, but that's not our first thought. But here he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. We want to alleviate all stress in our life that we can. We believe that we live a life that has too much stress in it. And for the most part, we try to eliminate as much stress as possible under doctor's orders. You know, you have too much stress in your life. And so we want to eliminate stress. But what about when God allows stress to come into our life in order to more deeply develop our faith and our walk with him. And this is where it ties in or overlaps a little bit with this morning, where I said bad times can be good times to strengthen our faith. Bad times can be good times to strengthen our faith because it's when we need faith. As long as you've got it under control, we don't really need to trust God. But when things get beyond our control, now we have no choice but to trust God. And so I want to... Uh, talk about the, the uh, benefits then of, of what God allows, when God allows problems to come in our life in order to stretch our faith. It puts us under pressure. But it's then that God can do something with our life. We've enjoyed some music tonight. The average uh, concert piano, uh, similar to what we have uh, over here tonight, has uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 strings. And all of those strings are, are tightened to a, certain, uh, to a certain tension in order to produce a certain sound. Miss Lois down here playing the violin. Before she can play that violin with us, uh, she has to tune that violin to the piano. And you do that by tightening the strings, and they must be under pressure for it to produce the beautiful music that it produces. All of the 240 strings on a concert piano, tightened to put that piano in tune, combined will pull over 400,000 pounds of pressure on that piano. And so all of that pressure, boy, you see, doesn't it sound like Boy, just the piano might be happier if you just loosened all the strings. But then we wouldn't get any beautiful music out of it because that stress produces the beautiful music. Those, those strings under tension produce the beautiful music. The same thing is true in our life many times. 
It is when a Christian is under stress that God can produce beautiful music of faith from our life. And so we, we need to recognize that God has a purpose. Sometimes God has a purpose to the trials in our life. And so we want to consider the purposes of God's trials when God is stretching our faith. Don't lose your place in the book of James, but look with me in the book of Romans chapter number eight. This is a, a fairly familiar verse of scripture, but in Romans chapter number eight and verse number 28, Romans chapter eight and verse number 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them who are called the called according to his purpose. Uh, excuse me, to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we know that what God allows in our life is going to work together for good. Individual things may not be good, but when they're mixed together, they, they produce something good. Uh, we just recently had our church anniversary and uh, the young ladies <clears throat> made some pies and the not as young ladies, married ladies made some cakes. And there's all kinds of ingredients that go into that. The same with the men making the chili, that if you took any one ingredient uh, of that recipe and just ate it by itself, it would probably not taste good. But when you follow the recipe and you mix it all together, it produces something that does taste good. And while problems that come in our life will not be pleasant, all things that God allows in your life, when they work together, they come around and work with each other and produce something good in our life. And that thing is faith. The development of our faith happens as we're going through trials. Everyone here tonight is either going, uh, uh, just going through life or we are growing through life. One or the other. We're going through life or we're growing through life. Temptations, back in our text, when you fall into diverse temptations, the word temptations means testings or trials. Testings or trials. And so the Bible talks about uh, count of law joy when you are tried, when your faith is tried. Now the word tempt in verse number 13, let no man say that uh, when he is tempted of God, uh, excuse me, excuse me. No, no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You say, well, wait a minute. We're supposed to count all joy when God allows uh, testings to come in our life, but we're not supposed to say we're tempted of God. The difference is, comes from a different word. The word tempt in verse number 13, uh, is, it means to try to get someone to do wrong. And God is not trying to get someone to do wrong. He allows a test in your life to strengthen your faith. But if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness in Matthew chapter number four, you find that he went there to be tempted of the devil. Satan tries to tempt you to do something wrong. God will allow a test in your life to make you strong. And so there's the, the difference or the distinction. God has never promised to make me comfortable. You ever think about that? He promised to comfort me, but he didn't promise to make me comfortable. Romans chapter number eight, the Bible says, and we're not going to take time to turn back over there, verse 29, that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you've ever played with any modeling clay or maybe some of you kids, you know, you get some Play-Doh or some modeling clay, and, uh, and uh, that's, that's fun stuff to play with and mess with. And you can form it into all kinds of shapes. And all, you, know, you can try to make, you know, like you try to make a horse that everybody thinks looks like a dinosaur or something like that. But to form it into shapes, you have to push on that clay. You have to press it maybe into a mold or, or press it or stretch it or twist it. And, uh, you know, you're putting it under pressure in order to make it look like what you want it to look like. And the same thing is true that God oftentimes allows pressure to come in our life to help us to look like what he wants us to look like. And so the Bible says that when you fall into uh, try, the trying of your faith, back in James chapter 1 and verse 3, the trying of your faith 
worketh patience. <clears throat> the idea of patience, patience means that we're able to endure something. If you are patient, that means you're able to, in a prolonged fashion, bear up under something. Someone's going through problems. What are you doing about it? I'm just being patient. I'm waiting on the Lord. Patience comes through trials. Joseph in the Bible was around 17 years old when his brothers uh, planned on killing him and end up selling him into slavery. 13 years later, he's the he's second in command, the second most powerful person uh, in that area of the world and maybe the whole world at that time. 13 years later, patience produced that in Joseph's life. He had to surrender to the will of God while he was being wronged in order to get to where God wanted him to be. Joseph's path to the palace was not an easy one. It was through a pit in the ground. It was through a servanthood in Potiphar's house. It was, it was through prison and then to the palace. And, uh, but Joseph had to be patient under, under stress or under trial as God was making that happen, putting him in a position where he could be where he, where he needed to be. The world is looking for people whose faith is not only spoken, but it's proven. Someone who lives what they say. My wife and I, we often get very frustrated. We're talking about different things where, you know, people that are in the public eye talk about Christ or loving the Lord and then the next word out of their mouth is a curse word or uh, their life, uh, they look and smell and act like the world and yet they give lip service to Christ, that form of Christianity that blends the world with, with uh, the Christian life is not Bible Christianity. The Bible says, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. God calls us to a life of separation and holiness and godliness. You say, oh, that sounds pretty bad. No, it's, it's, it's fantastic because you say, well, you missed so many things. Yeah, you missed all the heartache. You missed all the problems. You missed all the hangovers. You missed all, the, all the, the broken homes and all of the problems and trouble that go along with it. You miss all of that. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 5, matter of fact, we're close there. Just look in 1 Peter, just a little bit to the back, towards the back of your Bible there. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Notice verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Throw, put your care on Christ. Why? Because he cares about you. But it, it causes us, it, excuse me, it, it means that we have to humble ourselves under God's hand. And say, you know, the first thing that comes to our mind when we start having problems, we say, I don't deserve this. I deserve better than this. Well, no, I don't. I don't deserve better than this. I deserve judgment from God, and yet he has granted me mercy. So the world is looking for people whose faith is not just spoken. It's not just something you wear uh, as a name tag, but you live that. And so the purpose of the trial is to stretch our faith and verify our faith. But what is the process? The Bible says back in our text, let patience have her perfect work. That word perfect means complete. And so there's a process where patience, tribulation works patience. And then that patience has to have its perfect work. It has to have time to work. It's like somebody praying, you know, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. Well, that's the opposite of being patient, isn't it? We want it patience and we want it immediately. Peter had made a lot of mistakes and he had a lot of sin in his life. But with every mistake, with every failure, he was being brought closer to his potential to be used by God. The Bible records, you know, if man wrote the Bible and man was going to hold up Peter as an icon or uh, a role model, it would have ignored 
the failures of Peter. Peter had several failures recorded for us in the Bible. He denied the Lord publicly. He denied the Lord. He left following Jesus and said, I'm going back. I'm going to go fishing. He had problems with, he got, he got on the wrong side of some of the, the doctrine of God's grace to the Gentiles. He, he sometimes he wasn't all, always uh, successful in everything he did. But with every failure, he was being brought closer to what God needed him to be to preach on the day of Pentecost and see thousands come to Christ and be saved. Because he grew through every failure. <coughs> he, he was helped along the way because he failed and he got back up. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. And so he failed, but he got back up and he learned from it. And so the stress in our life that God allows in our life, the testing that God allows in our life, often is helping us to be what God needs us to be. Think about this. When you got saved, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God has a purpose in mind for your life. But you don't know if you're fully ready or equipped to do that or fulfill that purpose. We think, oh, we're, you know, it's like I tease with young people most of the time. I say, oh, man, you're, you know, 10 years old or you're 15 years old or whatever it might be. And so, oh, you, you've got all the answers now. You know everything there is to know. When I know that they haven't even had a chance to hear all the questions, much less have all the answers. But, you know, we kind of get that way sometimes. We think we, you know, well, I'm ready to take on everything that I'm going to have to. You don't know what you're going to have to take on. You don't know what God's going to have you to do. You don't know what God's got in front of you. You think you're ready, but you don't know if you're ready. But with every trial, with every difficulty, with every obstacle God allows in your life, he's making you more ready to do what he wants you to do in the future. You say, what is it? I don't know either. But you'll know when you get there. We need us to, to let patience have her perfect work. We need to surrender. That means we yield to God. Okay, God, whatever you want with my life. First of all, surrender your past. Peter had many mistakes, as I've already said. I've already said. As we read tonight uh, in the book of Philippians, Paul said, I count not myself. Oh, actually, it was not the verses we read tonight, but the same same general passage of scripture, he said, brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. You know what you have to do with failure? When you fail at something, you know what you have to do with it? Learn the lesson of it and then put it behind you. Learn the lesson and then put it behind you. You know what it means to ask God to forgive you for something? When you've done something wrong and you say, God, forgive me for that. That means you've learned from it, you've confessed it, and then you put it behind you. You know why you can put it behind you? Because God's forgiven you for it. So you put it behind you. You don't keep living as if that's still the reality. That's the past. Surrender your past to the Lord. I've used this illustration, but not for a while. Quite a few years back, I was, had the opportunity to go down to Illinois to a little country, a little rural church, and preach. I had been familiar with the church a little bit from my years growing up in central Illinois. My dad was a pastor just outside of Peoria, in East Peoria, Illinois. And uh, this was a church some, oh, 40, 40 minutes, I think, from there. And so I had I'd known of the church, known the name of the church, but I'd never been to the church. Well, in all the years that had transpired since that time, a lot of things had changed at that church. They had a, a, the patent man that was pastoring the church I had gone to Bible college with. And so he had asked me to come there and preach a revival meeting. But when I got there, I noticed that the church, about half that country church, <clears throat> was made up of people that had been a member of my dad's church that he pastored, you know, 15, 20 years earlier. And so they knew me when I was a teenager. And in case you're wondering, knowing me as a teenager was not a good thing. It was before I came to Christ, before I was saved, and, uh, and, and I didn't have a good testimony 
as, uh, as I was growing up. And now I'm about to get up and preach to a bunch of people that know me from back, back then. And uh, it is a humbling thing. But you surrendered your past to the Lord and you, you've asked, it's, it's all forgiven. So I just had to get up and I said, a lot of folks here knew me from when I was young. And I said, I got saved as a, as a man of 21 years old and all that's in the past and God forgave it all to me. And I want you to know that God changed my life. And I got up and preached the word of God. Hey, we gotta just, we can't run from that. We just give it to the Lord. Those things, the things which we've done in the past that we're not proud of. Hey, we confess it, we forsake it, and then we leave it with Christ. Surrender your past to the Lord. Don't ruin your future by living in your past. And then surrender your present to the Lord. And that's simply day by day yielding to him. Lord, whatever you'd have me to do. But then I have to hurry on, surrender your future to the Lord. Surrender your future to to the Lord. I read the story of the illustration of a very nervous man that was about to get on a, an airplane. He was pacing back and forth in the terminal because just outside the windows there was a bad storm brewing and it was blowing in and you could see it, the lightning and everything was blowing around and they were talking about possibly canceling flights and things like that. And as he was walking around, there was a little machine there that sold as a little, uh, like a little coin operated machine type of thing, where you, know, where you, where you put in a, a credit card, and they were selling life insurance policies through this little machine. And uh, you could buy $100,000 of, of, of temporary life insurance, like travel life insurance, basically, $100,000 in the event of an untimely death aboard an airplane. And, uh, and the uh, policy was only $3, and so he thought, you know, he looked out the window and he saw the lightning and, the, and all that, and he's, you know, and he thought, that's, that's probably a good investment. So he bought, he bought a $100,000 life insurance policy uh, for that flight. And then, and so he walked on down, he's looking for a place to eat, and he uh, found that he loved Chinese food, and so he went in this Chinese restaurant, and he... And he uh, sat down to eat, and he got real nervous, though, when he opened the fortune cookie. Because the fortune cookie read this, your recent investment will pay big dividends. <laughs> you know, you buy a life insurance policy hoping to never need it, amen? <laughs> the same with any insurance policy, but... But, you know, we need to surrender our future to the Lord and say, you know, whatever God has for me and for the future, that's what, that's what is best for me. A lot of people are, are nervous about the future, fretting about the future, but no matter what your problems, your past, your present, and your future, Jesus is ever present and he's our intercessor uh, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number four, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So he says, then he says, so let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Worry is the result of calculations made without God in the equation. Worry is the result of calculations made without God in the equation. All of my problems, all of my inabilities, mixed with dangerous circumstances, equals nothing but trouble. Hold it, you forgot to add something in. You forgot to factor something in. And that is... God and his will. When you, act, when you factor in God and his will, oh listen, it, it doesn't make your problem go away, but it does remove the fear and the uncertainty. Because even though I don't know what's going to happen, I know that it's going to be all right. A process of strengthening us. The testing is a problem, process of strengthening us in order that we might be uh, made stronger spiritually. And then let's talk about the product of 
the trial of our faith. Verses 5 and 6, back in James, we did not read these verses a moment ago. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. We are more apt to gain real wisdom during a trial than when things are going easy. We are more apt to learn to gain real wisdom when we're going through a trial than when we're not having a trial. You learn more, again, you'll gain more under stress in your walk with God. Yes, you potentially will because it's dependent on how you face it. We must ask for wisdom by faith. Think about this. Even when we pray, it must be by faith, nothing wavering. When we pray, do we really trust God? When we pray, the Bible says this uh, in Romans chapter 4 of Abraham. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith giving glory to God. He staggered not. At, you know, when we face problems, they cause us to sometimes stagger because our faith is not as strong as, it, as we thought it was. Listen, you think you have faith. Here's the test. When problems come, is your first thought to trust the Lord, that he's going to take care of it? Or is your first thought, oh no, this, this is big. What am I going to do? You see, that's the, really the measure of our faith. It's not how we feel when things are going well. It's how we feel when things are not going well. And so, what is our command? Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. It's one thing to ask for wisdom. It's another thing to believe that we will receive it. And Jesus Excuse me, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, or chapter 12, and he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. That's when Paul was praying that the thorn in the flesh, his physical problem, might be removed, might be removed from him. And he prayed, and God said, no, I won't remove it. He said, but my grace is sufficient for you. Do you understand this? That no matter what, you, no matter what problem you face in your life, God's grace is enough. It is sufficient. You say, well, preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. It doesn't matter because I know God's grace. His grace is sufficient. There are people in this room that have suffered the loss of a loved one, a family member that maybe uh, has passed away. God's grace is sufficient. You say, well, it still hurts or it's still, it's still, uh, there's still a, a vacuum there, an emptiness there. Yes, but God's grace is sufficient. God's grace will help you if we will depend upon him. So we'll receive wisdom. What happens? What's the result of the testing? Uh, uh, first of all, we get wisdom. Second, uh, we mature spiritually. We mature spiritually. God of peace, the Bible talks about, establishes us. You know, there are many examples of people who their faith was tested beyond measure. Beyond, any, you know, it, think, the thing about tests are that they get increasingly more difficult. Some of you uh, young people that are in school, and how many of y'all just, just, you just love math? <laughs> and, no, I mean, I don't mean that. I mean, you don't like math. How many of you students don't like math, all right? Uh, you know, the math test you take today, I got some news for you. You just started a school year. But the test you take at the end of the year, I, got some, I, 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 know what, I know something about those tests. You ready? They're going to be harder than the one you're taking to now, uh, today. Because that's the way they do them. But between now and then, guess what? You're going to learn some things, I hope. <laughs> you're going to learn some things so that when you get to the harder test, you're able to handle the harder test. You couldn't handle it today, but you've got a lot of tests between now and then that each one is going to teach you a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more until you get to that harder test and then you'll be ready to handle it. The same thing is true about life. 
<coughs> very often we, we, matter of fact, every trial of our faith is more difficult than the last. The Bible talks about one of the, the, the worst enemy, the last enemy of, of man is death. And I remember a very, some of y'all will remember the testimony of a man named Horatio Spafford. Now you might think his biggest test was growing up with the name Horatio. But he lived back in the 1800s and the 1860s and he was a, he was a businessman, a wealthy developer. He got saved and grew in his faith under the ministry of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody you probably have heard of. In 1871, his faith was tested during the Great Fire of Chicago. And a lot of his holdings, a lot of his property was, was destroyed in that fire. And that, that's probably seemed to him like the greatest test that he could ever experience to his faith. But just two years later, he faced a much greater test to his faith. Greater than, uh, and I forget the, the amount of, of property that he owned that was destroyed and lost in that fire. He went from being extremely wealthy to not being so wealthy because most of what he owned was burned up. But two years later, he was taking a trip with his family to England. And he was busy with with the business, and so he sent his wife and his children ahead of him uh, on a, uh, on a uh, cruise ship and, and that he would come and meet them later. Well, in the course of that journey uh, to England, that ship that his family was on collided with another ship. And uh, through the course of the night, the rescuers found his wife clinging to a piece of lumber. When she was able to get to where she could signal her husband about the loss, she sent a, uh, a wire to him that said just two words, saved alone. And that let Mr. Spafford know that his children, his daughters, had perished in that, that uh, shipwreck. So Mr. Spafford dropped what, all his business dealings and his wife was now in England and he boarded a ship to go and meet his wife and comfort her. And the captain came to him one evening and said, Mr. Spafford, we are now passing over the spot. Where your, where your daughters died in that shipwreck. And he went, as he was passing over that, that spot in the ocean, he went to his cabin and he wrote these words that we know to be a hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. God was able to give him immeasurable peace through a tragedy that we think we could not handle it. But God had been preparing him to handle it and increasing his faith through trials, through problems, through testings. And that's what God is trying to do with us. He's trying to increase our faith by letting our strength be tested by putting our faith to the test, he's allowing us to have stronger and stronger faith. You say, I don't want to go through these tests. Yes, you do, and let me tell you why. Because there's a greater test coming that you don't know about. I can't tell you when it's going to come. I can't tell you what it's going to look like. I just know this, that there's greater tests coming. You have not yet suffered as you can suffer. You have not yet been tested like you can be tested. And what you'll need then is a stronger faith than you have now. So you want the test. I'm trying to explain to you how we can get the mindset of being grateful for the tests. Of counting it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Why? Because there's a test coming that I, I, I'm not ready for today, but I need to be ready for. And the only way I'm going to have stronger faith is if I go through the trials and the tests 
of this day so that I'll be made stronger. If you know Jesus, it is well with your soul, even going through trials. Often it is the trials of life that we, uh, through the trials of life, that we are able to appropriate God's amazing grace and develop the character that's needed where, where the Bible says, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The Bible talks about rejoicing, <clears throat> though now for a season. Matter of fact, look with me in 1 Peter chapter number 1. Don't forget what we just read in James to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. But the last passage of Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 6 and 7. And we'll close with this. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. That word rejoice means to jump, leap, dance, sing. That's rejoicing. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold, that means many, or multiplied temptations. Those are the tests. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We are to praise God for the test today. Because when he comes and he has, we have the testimony of stronger faith, of increased faith, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be to the praise of God and what he has allowed us or strengthened us uh, and helped us through for his honor, for his glory. You say, I don't want the trials today. Yes, you do. Because there's something greater coming. And so you want them. You, uh, it's not pleasant. It's not easy but they are preparing you for what is ahead that's more difficult. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, I pray that you would help us from the youngest to the oldest to find something in this Bible lesson that, we can, that, that will help us tonight, that we would understand that the trials of today are but preparation for greater trials in the future. And Lord, it can help us to be grateful, though we did not enjoy the problems of the past, we can be grateful for them because they've made us stronger. God, the problems that we face today, we can endure them realizing that a more difficult test is in the future, it's coming. And ultimately we'll stand before the Lord and we'll give an account of the things done in the body. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be stronger and stronger, to learn the lessons of faith if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. God, help us to ask you for it. And let faith have her, let patience have her perfect work that comes from the test. Knowing that you don't try to cause us to fail. A test is designed to cause us to succeed. If we fail, it's not the test's fault. It's our fault because we have not been prepared. God, I pray that in all these things, Christ might have the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. As we stand to our feet,